Let's we'll go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. We're going to pick up the verse 45 tonight. John, chapter 11. We'll pick up verse 45 and we'll finish out the chapter tonight. John chapter 11, verses 45 through 57 will be our text tonight. The title of tonight's message is A Conspiracy Plan in Heaven. A Conspiracy <laughs> Plan in Heaven. The assassination of John F. Kennedy sparked numerous conspiracy theories throughout the years. Uh, even today the question is still raised, did Lee Harvey Oswald act alone when he shot the president? Over the years, uh, various theories have accused 42 different groups, 82 assassins, and 214 different people of being involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, while some are not convinced about who's actually responsible for the death of President John F. Kennedy, our text tonight reveals who's actually responsible for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the closing verses here of chapter 11, we find that the religious leaders call a special meeting, and in this meeting they decide that Jesus must die. Verse 53 of our text here says that from that day forward they took counsel together to put him to death. Now it was a conspiracy. It was a plot. It was hatched by the hierarchy, the religious hierarchy of Jerusalem to eliminate this dangerous Galilean preacher who had stirred everybody up. But on another level, it was a conspiracy that had been planned in heaven. John reveals to us that God was sovereignly working through those who conspired to kill his son. Our text tonight excuse me, reminds us of God's sovereignty. He has the power to rule and overrule the plans of man, carrying out his gospel uh, plan and bringing all the glory to Jesus. So let's read here tonight in verses 45 through 57, then we'll have prayer together. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 45. <clears throat> then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Remember this morning, Jesus had just told him to roll the stone away. He looked at that dark, cold tomb called Lazarus forth by name. They've seen these things and John says many of them believed on Jesus. But notice here what happens every time that everybody believes. Verse 46. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and that's the religious leaders and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. You guys don't have a clue. Uh, verse 50, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. <clears throat> and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, what think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, 
he should show it that they might take him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your divine word, its inspiration and its infallibility. We thank you that it's eternal. Father, thank you for the truth of the text tonight, that you are still on the throne of heaven no matter what happens. And although we may come, <clears throat> come up with our best schemes and plans, you're still in charge, ruling and overruling. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the conspiracy that you planned in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice three things here with me tonight as we think about a conspiracy planned in heaven. First of all, I want you to think with me and notice here with me <clears throat> the enemy's problem with Jesus. The enemy's problem with Jesus. Now verse 45 records part of the reaction of this amazing miracle that people had seen Lazarus been raised from the dead. And John says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on Him. So many in the crowd heard Jesus' call to Lazarus and watched in awe as this dead man came out of the tomb, shuffling, uh, bound in his grave clothes. And they come to believe that Jesus must be the Messiah. Now, how could anybody witness something like that and not wind up being a believer? I don't know. But yet we find here not everybody was convinced. When the word got back to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, rather than them being filled with wonder at what he had done, they were filled with worry. They were afraid of what was going to happen next. Now, these men refused to believe in Jesus. They were dead set against Jesus. Why is it that the religious leaders had a problem with Jesus. Well, two things. First of all, I want you to notice here that they were threatened by Jesus' power. They were threatened by Jesus' power. Think about it. He made a blind man to see. He made a lame man get up and walk. And now he had raised a man, dead man to life. Now, for you and I as believers, that, those are just simply signs of his supernatural power. We even say, hey, that's a witness of how great our Lord is. But this kind of power was a threat to the religious leaders. Now verse 47 says these men get together, they have their meeting to discuss Jesus, and they say basically, basically they say, what are we going to do about this guy? He's doing all these miracles. We've got to come up with some kind of plan here to do something about Jesus. And we find here these men saw the power of Jesus as a reason for fear instead of faith. You see, here's the problem. Jesus was more powerful than they were. Amen. You see, there's a lot of people today that are still afraid of an all-powerful Jesus. They don't mind so much the gentle Jesus that we talk about in Sunday school class. They don't mind they preach uh, uh, peace, preaching Jesus, uh, Jesus who talks about love, uh, uh, saying things that are interesting, but they don't want a Jesus who's powerful they don't, want to, they don't want to embrace the Jesus who created heaven and earth. Uh, they don't want to embrace the Jesus who uh, can supernaturally do all things. This, this Jesus who must be God, He's too much for them to handle. Why? Because that would make Him more powerful than them. A lot of people, they just simply don't want anything to do with Jesus because they're threatened by His power. You see, they don't want anything to do with Him because He is a threat to many. Secondly, why did they have? The enemy have such a problem with Jesus. They were threatened by his power. They were also threatened by his Jesus' potential. Now notice what the council said there in verse 48. If we leave him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Now the council feared that if enough people came to believe that Jesus was Messiah, there'd be a political uprising. They said, hey, we've got to tap this thing down. We've got to nip this in the bud. If enough people begin to believe in Jesus, we're going to lose our position. Do you notice that? Our place and our nation. Mm -hmm. It was selfishly motivated. If Jesus gets all these followers, he'll have an uprising and the Roman governor will come down here and put the iron fist down on us and we'll lose our position. We'll lose our promise. We'll lose our power. They were threatened by the potential that Jesus could de 
thrown them. He could unseat them. They had selfish fears, you see. And see, Jesus didn't come to build a political kingdom, but they didn't understand that. And while it sounds as if their concern was for their nation, their people was really just selfishness. You see, he, he had the potential to unseat them as leaders and rulers over the people, and they were right. But here's the thing. They couldn't be Lord if Jesus was Lord. They enjoyed their promise and their position at the temple and around town and, and, in, and having authority in town. They enjoyed being lords. They, with a little L, they enjoyed being in charge and having authority. And if Jesus was Lord, they couldn't be Lord. You see, they didn't want to bow to Him and let Him lead. They wanted to bury Him, you see, and keep Him from being a power. There's still some people today who just simply will not accept Jesus and really what it comes down to is they refuse to bow the knee. They recognize that if Jesus is Lord, they can't be Lord. Some people enjoy their autonomy and their authority too much to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people have, have no desire to be led by Jesus because they like living their own life. When you get down to it, it's a selfish motive. No different than, this religious, than these religious leaders. They simply want to live their own life on their own terms, do their own things. They don't want Jesus to be Lord. Secondly, notice here tonight, not only the enemy's problem with Jesus, they were threatened by His power, they were threatened by His potential. But I want you to notice here the enemy's plot against Jesus. Now, while Jesus had done nothing wrong, the council met here to discuss what to do about Him. And because they refused to believe in Jesus, they had to come up with a plan to get rid of him. We've got we to get rid of this guy. And what they came up with was nothing less than a murder plot. But John wants us to see that this secret meeting really wasn't a secret. You see, this is what I love about this text. God was in the... And God met with them that day. They thought they were having a secret meeting. They thought they'd come up with a plot that nobody knew anything about. But God was working through their plot. You see, they thought they were deciding on the killing of Jesus, but God was actually deciding on the murder of His Son. Mm -hmm. God was going to allow it to happen. Consider two things we hear with me about the enemy's plot against Jesus. First of all, it had a selfish purpose. It had a selfish purpose. Now the council of the religious leaders asked the question, what are we going to do about Jesus? How can we get rid of this guy? And the answer comes from the top dog, Caiaphas, the high priest. And he says there, you guys don't have a clue. <laughs> don't you see? He says it's better for all of us. If we're going to keep our positions, if we're going to keep our power over the people, it's better for us that one man die than the entire nation be, destroyed, be shredded to pieces. You see, with a selfish motive, Caiaphas is determined that Jesus had to die so they could keep enjoying their lifestyle. We can't be the big dogs in town if Jesus is going to be Lord. It's better for us. It's better for our bank accounts. It's better for our pride if Jesus never gets to be Lord. You see, the death... Oh, Jesus was a matter of their political survival. They didn't want to give up their political careers. Their plot here was sinful, but it was selfish as well. You know, this is a good place to remind us tonight that we have an enemy who's plotting against us and he wants to see us be destroyed as well. Amen. My friend, his name is Satan. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, we have an enemy and his name is Satan. He does not like you and he doesn't like me. His plan, His desire is to shred my ministry. His plan, His desire is to shred my marriage and shred my children. His plan is to tear your life to pieces. He has a plot. He wants to destroy you, friend. And He won't be happy until He thinks He can do so. The Bible says He's a roaring lion seeking whom He may devour. And your life is a threat to His kingdom. And your life is a threat to Him and all His demons because they're dead set on destroying you even as they try to destroy Jesus. Friends, you need to understand tonight you've got a real enemy. He would love to destroy you. Everything about you. 
The enemy's plot against Jesus, it had a selfish purpose, but secondly, it had a sovereign purpose. Now with the... <clears throat> With a selfish purpose, Caiaphas says, hey, it's better for us that this one man die than for our entire nation to be ruined. But here's a, that sounds cruel, but notice verse 51. Notice what John says. Speaking of Caiaphas' words, Caiaphas' words, this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Look at verse 52 now. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Don't miss this. Caiaphas had a selfish purpose, but God used his selfish purpose to accomplish his sovereign purpose. Amen. Notice what he said there. He said, and this spake he not of himself. In other words, Caiaphas' heart spoke words that were selfish, but God was simply using him to speak a prophecy. Amen. He was simply saying, hey, he's going to die, but not just for himself, it'll be for the nation and those scattered abroad as well. You see, God uses type his selfish words as a glorious prophecy. Now there's a couple of powerful truths here for us to get a hold of. First of all, our God is so big and He is so sovereign that He can overrule the schemes of our enemy and use them for His own glory. Amen. Caiaphas thought He was going to get something uh, selfish accomplished, but God had another plan. Amen. God used Caiaphas' selfish, Caiaphas, Caiaphas selfish words. I'm going to move on. They used the high priest's words to accomplish His plan. Amen. He just thought he was uttering selfish words. <laughs> Secondly, the powerful truth we need to get hold of is this. That by the death of Jesus, what seems like a success for the enemy was actually a victory for God. Amen. Listen, the devil and his demons just thought that day when they heard Jesus cry, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, they just thought they won. And at the end of the first day he was in the tomb, they thought they had won. At the end of day two, they thought they had won. At the end of day three, they began to shout and celebrate. But I'm here to tell you, friend, the worst thing that was ever done by the devil was to let Jesus die on the cross and be put in the tomb because he rose from the grave on the third day and snatched the keys of death and hell out of the hand of Satan. And he comes strolling out of the tomb. He was victorious. And he said, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. 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 You see, the worst thing the devil could have ever done was let Jesus go to the cross. And what the enemy thought was the successful plan was actually God's successful plan. He has a sovereign purpose in this meeting. You see, the glory of the gospel is this. Jesus willingly, sovereignly, and lovingly gave Himself over to His enemies so that by His substitutionary death and atonement, He could forever rescue all of His people from their sins. And they thought they'd come up with a perfect plan. I can imagine the meaning of the religious minds. They thought this is a great plan. But it wasn't their plan. It was actually God's plan. Amen. You see, God had foreordained that plan way back there in eternity past 10 trillion zillion billion years ago. Long before Caiaphas was ever thought of, God had already had the plan together. You see, it wasn't their plan. It was God's plan. Finally tonight, we've seen here the enemy's problem with Jesus. They were threatened by His power. Everybody begins to follow him, they would lose their position. He had the potential to unseat them as political and religious rulers. The enemy's plot against Jesus, it started out as a selfish purpose, but it actually served a sovereign purpose. <coughs> Finally here tonight, I want you to notice with me, the enemy's pursuit of Jesus. The enemy's pursuit of Jesus. You know, Jesus and the Father are one. Everything the Father knows, the Son knows. And God knew everything that went on in that meeting. 
They might have got in behind some closed doors there in the temple somewhere and made this little plot out, but Jesus already knew their plot. You see, He knew that death on the cross would, would, well, he knew, not only he knew their plan, but he knew God's plan. And he knew that God's plan was his death on the cross would ensure victory for him as Savior over sin. And we find here, because Jesus knew the Father's plan, he's not afraid of these people. He's not concerned about his enemies because he rests in the Father's plan. You see, Brothers and sisters, tonight, you and I need to learn to rest in the Father's plan. Sometimes we get worried about enemies, if you want to call them that. We get worried about individuals. May I say to you, friend, God can take that person you think is your worst enemy and accomplish through them exactly what He wants to do. That individual that opposes you and comes against you, God can take that individual and still work it out that His plan is done. You see, we can rest assured that as long as we're following God and He's the one leading us, we can be confident in His plan that it will all work out. Now, there's two things here about the enemy's pursuit of Jesus that I'll be done tonight. First of all, I want you to notice here that they worked for His end. They worked for His end. Verse 53 said there that from that moment forward, they, the plot to kill Jesus was in action. But look at verse 54. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. <clears throat> Jesus now moves to Ephraim and spends time with his disciples. However, the religious leaders are looking for Jesus. They're saying, hey, we've got to find him. Notice the first phrase of verse 56. Then saw they for Jesus. Now look at verse 57. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. In other words, they put an APB out. <coughs> they put an APB out on Jesus. Hey, anybody spread the word by decree of the, the hierarchy, religious hierarchy. Anybody that sees Jesus, you can tell us we want, we want him. We're pursuing him. We're going to get him. We are going to take his life. So we find here that they have put this APB out. They're working hard to bring his life to an end. But here's what I love. While the religious leaders are working to bring Jesus' life to an end, Jesus moves on to Ephraim and he waits for his end. You see, they can't take his life from him. What do he say? I what? I lay it down. You can't take it from him because he willingly lays it down. They're, they're pursuing him. They're coming after him. They're working hard to bring his life to an end. Jesus says, I'm going to go over and wait for my end. I'll go on my terms. I'll go when the Father's ready for me to go. You see, now here's the thing. Jesus wasn't hiding from the political powers that be. He was waiting carefully to obey the will of the Father. He didn't get in a rush. He didn't get in a hurry. He was on God's timetable. You see, Jesus was ready to go all the way to the cross, but He would not rush ahead of God's plan. Listen, let me tell you something. We're, I, as human beings, we're bad about this. We won't get ahead of God's plan. And then we wonder why it all comes crumbling down on us. You see... The hour of the cross was set by God and Jesus was committed to God's timetable. He knew the cross was... He was about to face the cross as we'll see next week in chapter 12. He comes into Bethany there. And all over in the middle part of chapter 12, His triumphal entry, that's the last time Jesus comes into Jerusalem and everything then from there on is to the cross. He knew the cross was in front of Him, but He was going to go on God's time. Not the religious leader's time. You know, tonight, you may know God's will for your life, and you may be confident in that. But may I tell you, friend, that you'd be the best thing you and I could ever do is wait on His timing. You see, we are to wait and obey the timing of God. And at God's hour for us, whatever that is, whatever He has for us, if we'll wait and obey Him and follow Him, it'll be there soon enough. Amen? Amen. Finally tonight, I want you to notice here, not only did they work for His end, but they waited for His entry. 
they waited for his entry into Jerusalem. Go there in verse 55. John tells us there that the feast of the Passover, that's one of the most important Jewish, there is the most important Jewish feast, it was getting near. And to prepare for the feast, thousands of Jews begin to flood in Jerusalem, getting themselves ready for, for, for what's involved in the Passover. The city starts to fill up, but notice what the talk is around the water cooler, if you will. Everything is about Jesus. Man, did you hear? Over there at Bethany, he called Lazarus from the dead by name out of the tomb. The religious leaders had put out an APB for him. He's wanted. Do you think he'll show up for Passover? Everybody was wondering, will Jesus show up for Passover? Every Jew was required to come to Passover. And the talk around town was, has he got the guts? Will he show up? Is he too afraid? Will he stay out of town? Notice there in verse 56. As the people say, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? In other words, hey, don't you, you think he's going to show up? Here's the thing. Jesus wouldn't come early, but he still was going to come. He may not have come early like the rest of them, some of the rest of them did, but he and but here's something else. He wasn't going to sneak into town either. We'll see, you, you're familiar with the triumphal entry. He commands the disciples, go get a specific colt. Tell the owner it's for the Lord. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people burst out in praise, praising him. Holy Hosanna. Giving him praise. He didn't sneak into town. When it's his time, he, he just makes a, a, a grand entrance. Waiting on the Father's timetable. You see, he enters into the city just like a king coming home after a battle. <laughs> Here's the thing. Long before this Passover ever happened, as I mentioned earlier, in eternity past, even before there was ever a Jerusalem on the face of the planet, Jesus the Lamb, the Bible says, was slain before the foundation of the world. And in chapter 12, we'll see next week, our hero comes riding into Jerusalem. He fearlessly rides into the enemy's bunker. He's not afraid of their threats or the cross that was before him. The Bible says he sets his face towards the cross. You know, this conspiracy theory that the council meant for evil, God meant it for good. You see, they planned to kill a Galilean preacher, but God planned to sacrifice His Son for those He came to save. Friends, when you and I see the sovereign, saving hand of God at work in our passage, you ought to be encouraged today. You ought to be encouraged tonight. You see, here's the thing. Jesus, the Son of God and Savior of the world, died on the cross not because His enemies put Him there. He died on the cross and rose from the dead so that His people could be triumphant over their enemy, the devil. You see, and the Bible says it so that you and I can one day be more than conquerors through His shed blood. You see, the enemy tonight loves to, he has a plot to destroy you and I as well. And maybe tonight you think, you know, I look at my life, my marriage, my family, my everything. It just seems like Satan is tearing it all to pieces. Friend, may I remind you tonight that the devil may have a plan to tear your life to shreds. But I want to remind you of what Romans 16 20 says tonight. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You see, the enemies of Jesus cannot win. Just like the religious leaders couldn't win, Satan couldn't win, and the devil can't win in our life. Ultimately, yes, he may win small battles, but he can't win the war. Amen? Amen. We have been guaranteed victory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and I tonight can rest. Next time you get a little worried, and you begin to rub your hands and you rub the flesh off you, and you're worried, get your Bible out and read Romans 8 28. 
Paul says that we know that all things mm -hmm. work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Amen. You know, as I said this morning, we played that what if game with God. But Paul says all things work together. That means the bad things in your life, God can use them to work together to accomplish His purpose. Just as these men thought they were accomplishing a selfish goal, God used their plan to save my soul. Amen. Think about that, friend. Well, isn't that good that God can rule and overrule? Amen. Amen. No matter what is planned against you and I, God can take it and work it out for our good and for His glory. Amen. Friends, I ought to give you courage and encouragement tonight. No matter what happens tomorrow, we'll trust in His sovereign plan for our lives. That means you may make a trip to the emergency room, but you can still look up and know He's on the throne. Mm -hmm. You may go in tomorrow and they give you your pink slip, but Jesus will still be on the throne. Your spouse may look at you in the morning and say, I'm done with you, but Jesus is still on the throne. Your kids may tell you they'll never have anything else to do with you, Jesus will still be on the throne. You and I can rest in the fact that God is still on the throne. Brother Walter, this kid is going to come. We're going to have a song of invitation tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. As our text revealed tonight, Jesus came to earth. God came and took on flesh, a body. To die on the cross to save you and I, to redeem us. Maybe He's speaking to your heart tonight about the need to come to, to come to Christ and place your faith in Him. I urge you to do that. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know what, preacher? I've been worried about a lot of things. Maybe you need to come tonight and get us off and say, Lord, I'm just going to rest in your plan. I'm going to listen. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. But I'm going to rest in your plan. That in the end, your plan is best and it'll all work out. You know, we can do a lot of us come up here tonight and throw our Maylocks and our Tagamut and our Rolades and our tongues on this altar and say, Lord, I'm tired of worrying. I'm going to trust you tonight. Whatever your need is, the altar is open. So we stand and say, what well, no, Brother Walter? 361 in the blue book. Number 361 in the blue book.